Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the beaches were copper, the pince-nez was golden, and the blaze was silver, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about the difference between Holmes's pipes? Or how often he smokes cigars versus cigarettes? Or what Egyptian cigarettes are like? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 332, Police Precautions. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you taking precautions this evening? I am always taking precautions. I always wear my bulletproof vest and my padded hat and my... Uh, just the upper part of my straight jacket, just to make sure that I'm prepared for any eventuality when we record our podcasts. Well, a, a padded hat or a padded cell is always something that is welcome for listeners of this podcast. I uh, can't <laughs> yes. tell how many people and we've hosts. driven to those, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, now, speaking of driven, before we yes. go any further, I have I have to tell you, that just four short podcasts ago, we did an episode on weapons in the canon. Yes. And I had mentioned at that time that it was a topic suggested by one of our listeners. Hmm. But I was uh, unable to locate the name of that listener because of my well-known memory. <laughs> uh, but however... You, you I, weren't it, wearing it, your padded hat again. I wasn't. No, my <laughs> aluminum chapeau. Dennis Kieser... Kaiser is a uh, colleague of ours and a great listener and a great fan whom I had been talking to at the Sons of the Copper Beaches. And I just saw Dennis um, a week or so ago at a meeting of the Redheaded League of Jersey and mm. remembered that Dennis, uh, who is in Mifflingburg, Pennsylvania, suggested the weapons Uh, topic to us. And so we need to send him uh, a lavish reward from the trifles vaults. Excellent. Well, maybe we'll send someone with a cudgel to beat him about the head. Um, No, (laughs) that's that's not what we want. Um, No, that's wonderful. Good to to know. And uh, Dennis, thank you very much. Uh, We will will grab something out of the IHO's trifles vaults and send it your way. So... That's a good suggestion. Well, in this episode, we're going to be talking about police, police, police. Um, A very specific uh, example of the police, particularly as it comes to the final problem. There's a few things there that deserve a little more scrutiny, or perhaps some scrutiny at all. Um, And it was inspired by an article in the 1991 annual report of the Franco Midland Hardware Company. This is a series of publications that was put out by the Franco Midland Hardware uh, Society over in England in the early 1990s. I think they did some Sherlock Holmes walks, and uh, they had a series of publications at the time. Um, And uh, there's a bunch of charming essays in this 1991 edition um, all dedicated to the final problem. So it uh, should be an interesting discussion. Um, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash trifles332. That's all lowercase. And uh, it will bring you directly to the Sherlock Holmes 
podcast.com website where you can see if there's any uh, additional links or you can sign up for email updates or, of course, sign up for Patreon. Support us there, and you can listen to the show without ads. And uh, we also have uh, tiers for thank you gifts uh, for some of our patrons. And, of course, every month, all of our patrons are eligible to be part of a drawing, random drawing, where we pull your name out of a canonical hat. I, I, I don't know if it's Henry Baker's uh, hat or a deer stalker. I'm, I don't know which hat we use uh, at the end of this month. Well, this is, this is May, Bert, so this is uh, the beginning of straw hat season. We ought to use a straw hat this month when we pull the names out. Um, but Oh, I that, like that. After yeah. May 15th, though, yes. After May 15th. So at the end of the month, we'll do that drawing. And then, of course, at the end of every quarter, uh, we do a drawing as well. At the end of every month, it's uh, for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal. At the end of every quarter, it is a free annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal. So please do get your names in as Patreon supporters and become eligible to win, win, win a big prize. Well, we promised we would talk with you about police precautions. And, you know, it's only, it's only uh, particularly relevant that we talk about it this week because, of course, you know uh, the famous date on which Sherlock Holmes met Professor Moriarty. Don't you, Bert? Oh, of course. Absolutely. What, what, what date would that be? <laughs> uh, Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, no, I think I think it was a uh, I think it was a Friday or Saturday, if I'm not mistaken, because it was Monday really? that Holmes was talking about everyone being captured. He had the whole Moriarty at bay over the weekend, and that, that gets into what we're going to talk about today. But May fourth, you know, mm. may may the fourth be with you. Uh, may fourth, eighteen ninety one, is that fateful date when Holmes uh, met Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls, and. It is uh, the the publication date for this episode is May tenth, which means tomorrow is Florence Day because a week later I found myself in Florence, as Holmes tells <laughs> Watson when he returns from the hiatus. I thought it was two interview. We need to interview Florence. She was a lucky lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Holmes made a break for it after uh, running away from. Colonel Moran, and uh, headed for literally headed for the hills, and uh, kept running until he uh, made his way south into Italy, and eventually arriving in Florence a week after May fourth. So May eleventh is uh, is a great Florentine celebration. Hmm. But we're not here to talk about Florence. We're here to talk about the police and the final problem. So this is this is interesting because Holmes tells Watson, who, by the way, Watson has never seen Professor Moriarty. He's taking Holmes for his word at all of this. And Holmes comes up with some description as to why he can't possibly uh, spring the trap just yet. And, and the timing is uh, important and the police are involved and uh, this, this paper... Uh, this essay in the Franco Midland Hardware Company annual report uh, gets at that um, that particular and peculiar police prevarication in the final problem. <laughs> Absolutely, it does. And Carol Whitlam is the author of this particular paper called "The Police Involvement in the Final Problem." And she begins by pointing out that Scotland Yard's attitude to Moriarty is, has changed. Inspector MacDonald in the Valley of Fear says, uh, I won't conceal from you, Mr. Holmes, we in the CID think you have a wee bit of a bee in your bonnet over this professor. I made some inquiries myself about the matter. He seems very respectable and learned and talented. So it seems that by 1891, the opinion of the police had changed, or had it? Well, 
Moriarty speaks of Holmes's interference, as you point out, as occurring on five separate occasions from the beginning of January to the end of April 1891. So it would appear that Moriarty had extended his practice to the continent and that Holmes's work in France was directly related to this. And after that, everything becomes unclear because Holmes says the police cannot act for three days. But he doesn't say why. Is there some vital piece of evidence missing which he confidently expects to turn up before then? Do they have to wait for some procedure or warrant? Holmes says his presence is necessary for the conviction, but not for the arrest of Moriarty. And yet, after the Reichenbach incident, the trial of the gang went ahead without Holmes, using the evidence he'd collected. Interesting. And then when Holmes and Watson alight at Canterbury, Watson intelligently asks, why Moriarty can't be arrested at the boat? And Holmes says the gang would escape and assures them, uh, assures Watson that they will have them all on Monday. An arrest is inadmissible. And he then predicts that Moriarty will follow the luggage to Paris and wait at the depot. And when Monday comes, Holmes telegraphs the London police and is surprised that Holmes has escaped. But that so, Moriarty you know, has escaped. It, yes, that Moriarty yeah. has escaped. So, so it, but it was Holmes who let Moriarty escape from the country. He didn't think <laughs> that Moriarty would leave Paris and go to London just in time to be arrested. So what's going on here? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, um, you know, there, there is some suggestion, uh, recall that, um, uh, New Scotland Yard had only been built in 1890. It mm. moved down to uh, to Whitehall, and uh, you know Holmes perhaps was not not yet convinced that uh, the New Scotland Yard had everything in working order, and holding the papers back, you know, and and uh, that that final note that he leaves for Watson mentions uh, pigeonhole M as mm. he uh, was was leaving the note uh, that um, there we could we could assume that Holmes wanted to be sure that the uh, the evidence that he had against Moriarty and company uh, would be completely safe until well I don't know if you can say the coast was clear or if he was clear of the coast or what but um, being that New Scotland Yard was in um, perhaps in uh, disarray still in that that short year of its first existence in Whitehall, Holmes might have felt more secure by holding onto the papers, holding back the evidence until everything was sorted. Um, it, it, to me, it seems like a lot of subterfuge and um, uh, maybe even a little paranoia here. Uh, as uh, was it, Inspector McDonald later said that uh, Holmes had a bee in his bonnet. That was from the Valley mm. of Fear, right? Right, um, right. Yeah. That, that, and and of course we know uh, later on, and, and Nick Meyer did a great job of this, kind of taking that uh, that paranoia, extending it to being a drug-addled paranoia, and um, <laughs> actually uh, showing Professor Moriarty to be the victim rather than this criminal mastermind. So, um, you know, all of these, all of this subterfuge, this, this paranoia, this careful movement, um, it, 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 it shows Holmes really on edge. And, and perhaps that's what for a good four or five months of dealing with professor Moriarty did to him where, uh, he didn't even trust the police at that point. Hmm. I think that's, that's a very good assessment. Clearly, Holmes felt the London police would not be able to deal with the situation. And Carol Whitlam points out that no formal procedures existed at the time of this case for international police cooperation, because the first attempt to put a system like that in place in Europe didn't occur until 1914 when a conference was held to agree on extradition procedures and the development of an international criminal 
record office. So all that happened after World War I, and Interpol developed much later beyond that. So there were mm. no formal extradition procedures to transition Moriarty, uh, transport Moriarty to stand trial. And so the idea is, as you point out, Holmes did not trust the police. Interesting, though, that Moriarty set the rooms on Baker Street on fire, <laughs> obviously in an attempt to destroy the papers, which were in Pigeonhole M. <laughs> so, uh, wait, wait, did Holmes keep pigeons? <laughs> <laughs> but well, that's, he had a great fondness. He had a great fondness for M's. You know, his yeah. his, uh, his his <laughs> collection of M's was a fine one. Maybe he was referring to his pigeons. Yeah. Well. That that method, setting Holmes' rooms on fire, was taking a page right out of Holmes' own book in A Scandal in Bohemia uh, mm. with the uh, the plumber's rocket there because uh, looking for where Irene Adler kept the photograph. Uh, maybe mm. uh, Moriarty thought that if Holmes was at Baker Street, they could uh, smoke him out as well and uh, the, the location of the papers. Mm, indeed, that, indeed. Well, that was the reason. Well, the, the, the direction here seems to be, what was the reason for Holmes deliberately delaying the rounding up of the Moriarty gang by the police? You know, why was that? And perhaps that's something we can explore after a brief word from our very well-informed sponsor. In 2023, the BSI Press has added more titles to its roster that you won't want to miss. First up this year is the latest in the BSI Manuscript Series, a title that takes you, well, maybe a moment to connect to the story, The Haven Horror. If you guessed The Adventure of the Retired Colorman, you're more clever than Josiah Amberley. This manuscript, once owned by Dame Jean Conan Doyle and bequeathed to the British Museum, is a very clean one, coming as it did at the conclusion of the canon. But the essays that accompany it are wonderfully informative. Dan Andriaco looks at prostheses in the canon. The BSI's resident toxicologist Marina Stajic brings us into the realm of poisons. And our own Bert Wolder tells about the life of the artist Frank Wiles. These and more are colorful, just as colorful as the original story that acted as a metaphor and reality, and it treats the reader to a kaleidoscope of shades and hues that will provide hours of reading pleasure. Be sure to get your copy of The Haven Horror before it's sold out at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. Okay, we're back after that cliffhanger. We're about to explore exactly why... Holmes decided to push off the rounding up of the Moriarty gang by the police. Um, and, you know, this, this is interesting, too, Bert, because th there are uh, a number of cases that are happening, uh, legal cases that are being tried here in the United States around uh, the events around January 6th. And obviously, there were a lot of people involved at various levels, but it really seems like a bunch of low-level criminals are being prosecuted right now. And this is part of a, a legal strategy. And I've listened to a number of uh, podcasts, interviews, etc., by former um, U.S. attorneys, and they, they talk about this methodology, not only in political crimes, but in... Uh, in mob-related crimes, when, when you're talking about the mafia or other organized crime, is they will typically go after the lower-level criminals first and try and get them to flip, that is, to turn evidence uh, and implicate other higher-ups, people where they were getting their orders from. And it's interesting that um, that wasn't necessarily the methodology here. Holmes was going for an all-in-one kind of approach. He was looking to keep a lid on everything until the very last moment and then uh, spring it on the entire organization all at once. Uh, an mm -hmm. interesting strategy. Well, that is very interesting. It's very apt because the reason suggested here is that Holmes 
created an elaborate plan to lure Moriarty to France, and part of it was delaying the rounding up of the Moriarty gang by the police to bluff the professor into thinking that he was in danger. So Holmes had set, according to this thinking, Monday is the deadline to get Moriarty on the move. But he found that he was constantly followed by Moriarty's men, and his movements were restricted. And after at least three attempts on his life, he calls upon Watson. And so he has this fear of air guns, and he edges around the wall, and he closes the shutters. And he doesn't really tell Watson, according to this, the true facts of the case. And he leaves Watson by climbing over the back wall into Mortimer Street, (laughs) his reason being that he would bring danger to Watson by staying. But in fact, Holmes had entered by the front door. And any watchers would assume that he was still inside, (laughs) which uh, isn't doing anything favorable for Watson. But this, you know, is what Holmes intended them to think. Well, and, and here's the question that I have. That is, if he was able to sneak away effectively, and whoever was watching Watson's front door assumed that Holmes was still there, or at least was going to tail Watson after uh, Watson set out, why wouldn't Holmes have sent Watson on something of a wild goose chase around London to keep Moriarty in London Hmm. rather than you know, taking him on this other wild goose chase that went to Canterbury and uh, eventually uh, onto the continent. Hmm. You know, they they could have just as easily run circles in London and kept things going unless they found it was too dangerous to be among all of those other criminals. Hmm. So Interesting. But, um, Watson, of course, in the final problem said, we would think, uh, one would think that we were the criminals. Let us, let us have him arrested on his arrival. And Holmes, of course, says, well, it would be to ruin the work of three months. We should get the big fish, but the smaller would dart right and left out of the net. No, on mm. Monday we should have them all. An arrest is inadmissible. Now, see, I don't, I don't get that. Wouldn't you rather have Moriarty rather than all the small fish? I mean, the small fish can't organize without the big fish. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, I think so. They would be much easier to round up. Well, the point of view in in this particular argument is that Holmes did predict Moriarty's movements. He got him on the move, and his, his hope was, his intent was, that Moriarty would be soon in the hands of the Paris police, but that things just didn't work out as planned. Mm. Um, so when Holmes telegraphs the Paris police, Watson mistakenly assumes he's telegraphing the London police, and that's what he writes into his account. <laughs> but, Holmes, but Watson never actually saw the message. And then Holmes tells Watson they've secured the whole gang with the exception of, uh, of Moriarty, um, you know, which, which uh, is, was for Watson's benefit. But the message from the Paris police told him that they'd failed to arrest Moriarty. It didn't tell him anything about how well Scotland Yard had played their part back in London. Yeah, that is uh, that's a good point. Well, uh, we finally uh, get the the name of the inspector who was involved in all of this in Holmes's final note to Watson. Um, and this is interesting <laughs> because I don't think we hear this name ever again. We certainly haven't heard it before. Uh, But Holmes says, uh, I allowed you to depart on that errand under the persuasion that some development of this sort would follow. Tell Inspector Patterson that the papers which he needs to convict the gang are in pigeonhole M, done up in a blue envelope and inscribed Moriarty. Uh, What do you make of that, Inspector Patterson? What happened to him? (laughs) Yeah, what happened to him? And more to the point, you know, where... Where did he come from? You know, it's it's not inconceivable that Patterson was somebody that Holmes met when he was when he Patterson was still a uniformed constable, and Holmes had somehow become impressed by the promise which he showed, and that uh, Patterson was now you know perhaps a newly promoted detective inspector, uh, and that maybe Holmes was trying to assist Patterson. 
Mm. But um, all of that, that is really supposition. It, it is. And I, I, I think there, there's so much here as, as the... As, as so much of the action is focused on Holmes and Moriarty, uh, this grand chase, uh, for, first of all, this, this meeting of the minds, this wonderful conversation the two of them had, the chase uh, down to Canterbury and across the continent and ultimately to the Reichenbach Falls, we don't spend all that much time thinking about exactly how Holmes could have collaborated better with uh, the police. And, um, I mean, Holmes himself, you know, mentioned that it, it's not his job to supply the deficiencies of the police. And yet, in a case as urgent and as serious as this, one would have expected him to uh, either take some more precautions or to uh, be a little more workmanlike in how he wrapped things up with the police. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. And it's interesting about these connections between Holmes and the police and his lack of trust in this case and confidence in the police. It calls to mind a comment that that Conan Doyle made um, once about E.W. Hornung. Hornung had married Conan Doyle's sister. And after his death, Conan Doyle wrote very complimentarily about Hornung's wit no one, he said, could say a neater thing. His criticism upon my Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle said, was, though he might be more humble, there's no police like Holmes. <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I must confess, Holmes, to being a little surprised. I am not retained by the police! to supply their deficiencies.